I think Jesus' Last Supper with the disciples is a big question mark to Western readers. Hardly any of us have ever experienced a full Passover meal. Obviously it was important to him, he explained to his disciples that he had looked forward to doing this with them and it was something that they did on an annual basis. So to have something that was so integral to his last week and the night of his arrest is really something that we need to spend some time and try to figure out. And Barry found a place where we were able to go and not experience the full three, four hour Passover feast, but a very condensed Passover feast. Having the opportunity to sit down and have the same dishes served to us and explained their significance and meaning was very beneficial. Hello. Hello. We serve what we call biblical meals here. I'm one of the main people who leads Passover meals. We basically do a very shortened, approximately half an hour presentation that is integrated with the food and the symbolic foods that we have passed down to us by tradition to this very day. There is actually often all kinds of singing involved in Passover. Families get together and it's a family event. And so the first element, this is the plate with symbols in it. Near to the beginning of the meal, we begin tasting things. You know, even though we may not eat traditionally for an hour or two, we start tasting stuff just so people don't get too antsy. And so we've got the sprigs of parsley. Sprig of parsley, a symbol of life, and also of the hyssop that was used to smear the blood on the doorposts dipped into the salt water, representing the tears of the children of Israel because of the slavery in Egypt, and parsley with salt water. That's really salty. <laughs> it is. The brownish stuff is actually sweet, and it represents the mortar. So we know that they built two whole cities for the pharaohs, it says in scripture. It's sweet, generally this is interpreted that even though you work hard, hard work is actually good for humans. And then finally we have the bitter herbs. And it's supposed to be hot enough that when you taste it, it makes you cry. Again, this idea of relating to the children of Israel and Egypt and their slavery. Thank you. What we do is, first we taste the bread on its own. So we have a sense of what it's like to eat unleavened bread on its own. Uh, this stuff is really nice. Uh, but the stuff that we actually normally eat in Passover, it's kind of like a saltless cracker. So, we taste the bread, then we taste it with the bitter herbs, which is very important because the bitter herbs are actually commanded to be eaten. And so we take some of the bitter herbs, hopefully this is wow. sharp enough to make us cry a little bit. Wow. Then we have a tradition, not something commanded in scripture, of mixing uh, the symbol of mortar with the symbol of suffering, and so we basically and we kind of put them together and uh, we eat it. It's definitely bitter. There's some bitter in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They complement each other a yeah, lot. They do. Mm -hmm. they do. And finally, the shank of a lamb. Uh, this is purposefully, uh, looks like it's been fired because the lambs are supposed to be cooked over a live fire and not boiled in water or anything else. And this reminds us, of course, of the original lamb in Egypt that the children of Israel slaughtered and used the hyssop to smear the blood on the doorposts and the lentils of their houses. And also then the perpetual sacrifice that was supposed to go on every year at the temple or the tabernacle to remember every year sacrifices were made at the Passover in remembrance of the original Passover in Egypt. So you were mentioning some of these elements over here. You mentioned the bitter herbs. That was a part of that. During Jesus' Passover meal, it mentions that he dipped his hand in the dish. Mm -hmm. What was that referring to? My, my impression of my memory yeah. says that it was some kind of sop. Usually sop was some kind of vinegary mixture. We see an example of this also in the book of Ruth, mm -hmm. where when she's invited by Boaz to, to partake, there's some kind of vinegar sop there right. that is part of their daily meal. So I think that's what that would have been. However, it's possible that maybe one of these elements of the also could have been the case. All right. When we celebrate a Passover meal, there's in sort of an order of service that I will go through. The cup is pretty primary. There's four cups of wine that we drink. Right. And they're based actually on the text in Exodus that's full of I wills. God says, I will take you out of slavery. I will free you. I will take you unto myself, etc. And it's interesting that Traditionally, the third cup after the meal is the cup of salvation, and it seems that Jesus 
picks up after the meal the cup and establishes what we call communion with the cup of salvation, which is what he's about to accomplish that night and the next day on his death on the cross. And so that's very significant, the symbol of the vine. Wine is actually not mentioned in Exodus, but we have it by tradition. And of course, when Jesus with his disciples sit down to celebrate the Passover meal in what we call today the Last Supper, there's wine present, of course, on the table. And in Jewish tradition, wine has a few meanings. First, it's a symbol of joy and of God's provision, but also, especially because of the color, it's also associated a bit with blood. And so this thing that Jesus does, I believe that is already established as having a connection to blood. But then we also have this interesting setup with the unleavened bread. We have three pieces of bread that are separated by linen. And this is a specific thing that's related to the Passover celebration. And so we have a very curious tradition. It's not really clearly explained. And that is we take the third of the matzahs that is in here, and at a certain point in the service, we break it and we take half and put it back together between the other two pieces. Again, this was the middle piece. And then we take half and we wrap it in another piece of linen. And this is hidden away by the master of the banquet who's doing the presenting. And the children go on a treasure hunt after dinner is over. And this has to be found. He will redeem it, either by money or a gift. And it'll be eaten as a final dessert. Even if mother created all kinds of dessert, unleavened, of course, this will be eaten at the end afterwards. And nothing basically else will be eaten that night. Everyone, of course, has stuffed a big meal. This is very significant. It has a curious name, afikoman, which seems to be a Greek word. One possible meaning is, I have come. This is curious. This is hidden away, and then it's brought back, redeemed, and then it is partaken of. And so, as a Messianic Jew, I believe that this is a wonderful symbol for Jesus. Notice he's in, in the middle, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, perhaps, right? His human nature, he dies, and he's wrapped in linen and buried away. But his eternal nature cannot die, and so it remains with God. And God resurrects him, and Jesus takes the bread and he blesses it and he gives it to the disciples and says, take and eat of this. This is my body broken for you. And we see this connection with the New Testament. Very beautiful. Because all the other explanations for this in Jewish tradition leave something to be desired. So those are the basic elements of the Passover meal. And just in brief, their significance according to tradition. I think there were three layers that we really tried to have explained to us. The first layer was understanding the original setting in which they observed it. So going back to the Exodus, going back to when the Israelites experienced the angel of death passing over their home, and the fact that they had sacrificed a lamb and put its blood on the lintel, and that spared the life of their sons. And then understanding how first century Jews partook of the Passover meal. What traditions had they developed and how did they practice it? And then the third layer was how toward the end of the meal, Jesus made the connection between some of the most important elements of the meal and what he was about to do in becoming our Passover lamb. And the fact that toward the end of the meal, Jesus took this meal in a slightly different direction may have caught them off guard a little bit. They didn't understand what exactly he was doing. Now would Jesus have acted as the head of the Passover meal that last night? Good question. Very likely since he was the master and he was the teacher. And we see him taking these elements and renewing them, you right. might say. Right. And so he redefines the cup and he says, this is reflexive, this is pointing to me. And the sacrifice of the lamb, the shank bone, right? Mm -hmm. I am the lamb. As John identifies Jesus, of course, the early, lamb of God. the Lamb of God, the bread from heaven, right? And he's been reframing this symbol of bread, yeah. the bread of heaven, the manna from heaven, the fact that he has come from the Father to give life to the world. It's obvious from everything on the table just how important remembering things was to God. And he wanted people to keep in mind the past deliverances that he had accomplished for them. And I think it really stands out that Jesus, during that last Passover meal, is making connections for them, trying to help them understand that he has become the Lamb of God, that he's about to sacrifice himself, and he's connecting himself with salvation. And 
the disciples never would have thought of a Passover meal the same way again. And I think it's interesting throughout what we refer to as Old Testament history, all those feasts were a series of reminders, whether it was the deliverance from the bondage that they had in Egypt or the struggles that they had in the wilderness during those 40 years or just the fact that God had delivered on His promise to bring them into the land. All of those things foreshadowed Jesus and the perfect fulfillment of them was in Christ. I want to experience a full meal. I mean, at some point in my life, I'd love to experience what a full first century Passover meal would have been like. And this first experience was just phenomenal. And from the text, we know that at the conclusion of that meal, after they sang some of the psalms, the hymns that are associated with the Passover, they finally left that meal and went out to the Mount of Olives. I'm Craig. And I'm Stu, and we're the founders of Appian Media. We really hope that you've enjoyed the content that you've just seen. This was only made available through the generous donations of so many of you. We believe that the world should have biblically accurate, visually engaging content about the Bible, and it should be free for everyone. We would encourage you to visit the membership page of appianmedia.org and consider becoming a reoccurring member. Everything that you donate to Appian Media is tax deductible. However you decide to donate, we really appreciate your support.